Okay, the next talk is by Dean Wampler. He's a local person and he usually frequents Case, Chicago Scholar Group. So this is his talk about Scala. It's gonna be interesting. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the first two days of the conference. I've had a bad cold and my voice is still a little scratchy, so I apologize if uh, I cough or whatever every now and then. So this is a talk about Scala. Uh, if you're re really interested in the talk, you might go to my website, Polyglot Programming, and download the talk uh, because it'll have notes that explain all the stuff that I can't really explain well and a bunch of other slides. And you can even get some of the, actually everything is on GitHub too, so you can pull it down from there like if you want to play with the code examples. Uh, yeah, so this is a code-centric talk. I will go through a lot of code. I'm going to try to explain what's interesting about it and hope that you'll get the gist, even if you don't follow all of the little syntactic quirks. But hopefully you, you can uh, pursue those separately if you decide you're interested. Uh, shameless plug, I did write a book on the language with uh, Alex Payne, who, who was at Twitter at the time. And it's an O'Reilly book. I see O'Reilly's a sponsor, so that's a good thing. Uh, keep me uh, fed by, by buying my book. All right, well, let's, uh, let's start with a question. Why would we actually be interested in a new programming language? You know, what's wrong with what we've got today? Well, I've sort of become convinced over the last few years that we really need to embrace functional programming. You know, for a long time, like most people, I just kind of thought that was one of those academic things that maybe will, has produced some interesting stuff, but, you know, object-oriented programming is, is the way to go. But a few years ago, people were talking a lot more about functional programming, in part because of issues of how do we scale up horizontally now that we've hit the end of Moore's Law, so to speak, at least with uh, you know, uh, CPU count, or rather tr transistor count on single CPUs. So we really have to scale horizontally and, and learn how to do that well, which you kind of are not very good at. So everyone was talking about functional programming as the way to do that well, and we'll kind of allude to some of those reasons. Uh, and so I started learning Scala in part to learn about concurrency. Um, but then I found out that there were a whole lot of other advantages. I started this quest, if you will, a few years ago, and I picked Scala as a way of kind of learning about functional programming with something real, namely a language that you could actually use. And I found that, wow, it gave me a lot of other benefits, like really concise code, a much more rigorous way of thinking about uh, program correctness. And I sort of actually flipped around and thinking, Instead of thinking that it, this would sort of complement my object-oriented programming, I kind of came to the view that maybe object-oriented programming should complement my functional programming. And that's actually the way I tend to program these days. Uh, and I think that's a big t topic and interesting to discuss, which we won't have time for. The, the gist for me is that the kind of problems we're doing today seem to be more like moving massive amounts of data through processing engines and how do we optimize that rather than modeling a domain. That just seems to be the nature of the problems, we, at least that I wrestle with on a daily basis. But the nice thing about Scala 2 is it actually gives us a better uh, object model. It fixes some flaws in Java's object model, uh, which we'll talk about briefly, and they help improve the ability to compose behaviors together in the sort of object-oriented way you're supposed to do that, and actually scale our designs. So we won't talk really about how that affords scalability so much, but hopefully you'll see the uh, compositional qualities that Scala brings to uh, coding. And, and the central thesis, actually, of the designer of Scala, Martin Odersky, is that really, even though on the surface these are two diametrically different paradigms in a way, like objects are all about mutating state inside the object and functional programming is all about side effect free functions and immutable values, in fact, you can bridge the two and, and have a nice synergy between them, and that's been kind of the thesis behind Scala. And it mostly works. You pay some penalties trying to mix these two. It's not as pure as, like, uh, you know, Haskell or maybe Clojure, but you still get the benefits of both if you want it. <coughs> there goes the voice. All right. That's why I grabbed this. But a practical problem, though, is that we all have a legacy code base. We can't just throw it away. Sometimes we can start new. Those of you who have done Ruby on Rails projects probably got lucky in that situation. So it would be great if we could keep our legacy code and still use it. <coughs> well, Scala mostly is a JVM language, but they are actively developing a .NET version. And that means you can just you know, enter call with Java code or C Sharp code, whatever. Like I said, it combines functional and object-oriented programming. It is statically typed, which is kind of against, uh, 
Excuse me. I get all choked up when I talk about this. It's, got, it's statically typed, and sort of the trend lately has been dynamically typed languages like Ruby, for example, and Clojure is another good example. But uh, Scala embraces static typing. <clears throat> and so in a, lot, in a lot of ways, whether you like Scala or not will really come down to you really, do you kind of enjoy type systems and, and what they can do for you. We'll talk a little bit about that benefit as we go along. But for some people, that just doesn't work. So fair enough. And I hope you'll believe by the end of the talk that Scala is actually an improvement over Java and even C Sharp, although to give C Sharp credit, I think it's an improvement over Java in a lot of ways. So again, the designer is Martin Odersky, the uh, guy who uh, started the project, and he's actually got a long track record with the Java community. Uh, he helped design Java generics, and don't blame him for all the flaws there. But, um, and it turns out the Java C that we're using is now uh, uh, descended from a Java that he wrote. And he's also really good about understanding uh, computer science and industry. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, let's start with the idea that everything can be a function. This is a functional language, right? So let's see if we can make anything behave like a function and why that might be interesting. And the first thing we'll start with is the idea that I could have an object but actually pretend that it's a function. So imagine that I want to create a convenience wrapper around a logging API. Uh, so I'll de declare this class called logger. And um, in Scala, the, the entire class body is actually the primary constructor, which is kind of convenient, it turns out. You can have secondary constructors, and we won't really go into how that's done, but just uh, think of it as just the body as the constructor for now. And that means that if you want to pass an argument list to the constructor, you just put it after the class name. So that's why the, we have this funny uh, expression after the name logger at the top. And here's how you would define a mes uh, method. They start with the keyword def, followed by the name, and then the argument list for the method. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that the typing is done with name, colon, value, sort of like Pascal does it. Pascal, sorry. Um, and there's a reason for that. Usually, whenever Scala departs from Java syntax conventions, they do it for a reason, not just to be arbitrary. It turns out that in a lot of cases, types are inferred, as we'll see. And it's a lot easier for the compiler to know whether you put in the type or didn't if it's name colon type versus type space name. The latter is more ambiguous. So what this thing does is uh, we'll construct a logger object and we'll define at that level as a field on the type, you know, what level of logging we want to do with this logger, Error, errors, warnings, so forth. And then we'll call this function apply, and that seems like an odd name, but we'll actually see why it's, we use that name in a second. And we'll actually pass the message we want to log and, and then pass it to log for j or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's see how this actually is going to work. Um, I'll instantiate my, uh, my logger object in, in the usual way. Now the val keyword, I didn't mention this, that uh, when it appears in the class uh, constructor list, it automatically turns that argument into a field without you having to write the boilerplate to do that. In particular, it's an immutable field. It's only readable. You can't set it again. Similarly, I'm declaring this variable error as a immutable value. Now, that has the usual meaning it has in Java, whereas, it, like, if this is a collection, I could put stuff in the collection, but I couldn't point the name error to something else. That's what that means. And then here's, here's the, uh, the key thing that we've been building up to. Notice that now I can pretend that error is a function. I can just call it, pass it a message, and the magic that's happening is the compiler, when it sees you put a, an argument list <clears throat> after an object, it looks for an apply method. And that's why I chose that name. So in a sense, I've actually created an object that behaves like a function. And any object that you declare with an apply method, you can do this. So you can have it do whatever you want. And so as a general rule, put an argument list after an object, it'll look for an apply method. And it's statically checked, so uh, at compile time, if you don't have an apply method it can call, you'll get an error. All right, so that was the idea of everything could be a function. Let's look at the reverse, which is that we could make, that essentially everything is an object. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, first, Scala doesn't have a distinction between primitive types and regular objects. So when you use ints, doubles, floats, et cetera, they're actually objects that uh, have methods and so forth. 
But if you look at the bytecode generated, they optimize to generate primitives so that you get that performance whenever they can, whenever they can make that, that assumption. Let's look at the idea that functions actually work like objects in this language. But first I want to do a little digression and talk about one of the fundamental data structures you always see in functional languages and even in, in non-functional languages, which are lists. So here's one way I could declare a list. I could say, you know, value list, uh, I'm declaring a variable named val, named list, sorry. And it's going to be a list of the five integers from one to five. Now the fact, you may notice there's no new in front of this uh, uh, green list word. I'm actually calling a f what is effectively a factory method um, that happens to have an apply method that lets me basically build a list with, in this case, it's just a convenience for not having to put in the new keyword. It could be more profound. For example, it could decide, based on the argument list, I'm going to instantiate this kind of list. Or, you know, this is a gigantic list. I'm going to put it in a tree structure. One of the problems with a lot of object-oriented languages is they don't give you the ability to abstract over uh, creation of objects, at least in a standard way. Now, you still have to do the work to decide how you would uh, instantiate the right kind of list. But Scala has this nice convention that you can define these factory objects with apply methods that then can do whatever it is you think is appropriate. Well, it turns out that this is identical to this list literal syntax, which is a nice convenient way of instantiating a list, especially if you happen to come from a Haskell or uh, even a, a Lisp background. So let's drill into this a little bit and see what's going on, because there's some very interesting stuff happening here. Uh, the terminology for this funky-looking double colon operator is the cons, as in construct. That's a, a, an old Lisp term for these things where you uh, build up a list uh, an element at a time. Also, this nil at the end is actually the, the empty list. So if I just wanted an empty list, I would just instantiate it as nil. Uh, the word is maybe kind of a bad choice because when I first saw the word nil, I, was, I thought of null or, you know, there's all kinds of languages that use that word to mean null. But in fact, it's an object, it's a, a list that's empty. And uh, some other terminology, just to be clear, is that the first element of the list is called the head and the rest of the list, which is itself a list, is called the tail. And that's why the, the last element can be a list, namely the empty list. So it's just sort of this recursive structure. Well, the logical assumption would be that this must be baked into the grammar. And you know, that's true in Haskell, and most languages would do something like this for some really popular data structure just by baking it right into the grammar. But as a matter of fact, these are just method calls on the list type. And it looks like this, which is really strange looking. So let's, let's drill into why this first expression is equal to this last expression. Well, the first fact is, um, Scala adopts the convention that whenever a function or a method, well, actually, I guess I'm jumping ahead of myself. First of all, method names can have almost any character, not just the usual ones that you are allowed in Java. <coughs> Some obvious exceptions would be parentheses would be ambiguous, so they're not allowed as method names. So I just have a, I actually have a method name that's called double colon, and people just pronounce it as cons because it's, that's what it's doing in the old list term. The other convention that's kind of an interesting choice is that if you end a method name with a, with a colon, it binds to the right and not to the left. So in fact, the way this is evaluated is I'm going to start with a nil list, call the cons method on it with five, create a new list, call the cons method on that with four, and so forth until I built up a list, essentially prepending each item to the front of the old list. So, and that works because it binds to the right. And they, I think they picked it specifically for this example because they wanted to have this nice list syntax. But it turns out there are other cases where it's nice to have that binding to the right feature. Um, oh, and the last thing is that when you have a method that takes one argument, you can actually drop the period in the parentheses so that you get this nice operator-like syntax, but in fact you're just making method calls. And to give you another example of this it's made, that doesn't have all this other stuff going on, in Java, this, the ability to add strings with the plus operator is baked into the grammar, and it's the only, only thing that you can use it for, except for the like, uh, number types. In Scala, it's just a method call on the string class. 
And the nice thing about this is that if you define, say, your own complex number type or whatever, you can define plus to, to behave exactly the way you want it to like this. So this is a really good example of actually the way that you can use some Scala features to build these little mini DSLs, in this case a DSL for object construction. Uh, I, on the slides at this point, the online slides, I'll, I go through the example of doing the same thing for map initialization. And I'd love to talk about it because it's, it's, it's got some even more interesting stuff going on, but for time's sake I won't go into it. But, if, uh, but I encourage you to look at the slides online for that. And of course you can do that with your own types as well. Okay, so we did this long detour on lists. Let's get back to this notion that functions are basically objects in this language. <clears throat> well, as you may know if you've studied functional programs at all, there's these sort of classic data structures that you find in functional languages like lists, also maps, maybe sets, things like that. And they typically have these three sets of core operations that you can do on them and then maybe variations of them or, or other operations that are built on top of these uh, fundamental ones. The first one is map where I take a collection and I map it to a new collection where I basically do some operation on each element. And in the functional way, I would not actually modify the original collection, I would create a new one as I go. Example might be I have a list of integers and I return a list of strings that just has each integer, you know, in quotes, as it were. The next operation is filter, like I want to filter out the odd integers and just have the even ones. Again, I create a new collection for that, at least in the pure world of functional programming. And the last are two related operations, fold and reduce, is where I take a collection and I collapse it down to something smaller, either a single element or another collection. Maybe I want to add my integers. And I get all broken up when I talk about that. <coughs> Sorry. All right. So to having mentioned those three collections, or those three uh, key operations on the standard collection types. Actually, the word container is a better one because we're going to see a container type in a minute that isn't sort of the traditional kind of collection, but it fits right into this model. So let's talk about lists again a little bit. So I have this very simple list of two strings that are in lowercase, and they happen to be one character each just to keep it short. And I want to map over this list to generate a new list with everything in, in uppercase. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm just going to call the map method that's on the uh, list type, and I'm going to drop the period because I can, and I like this kind of operator syntax. And in this case, I'm going to use curly braces for the argument list, which Scala lets me do instead of parentheses, because that gives me that sort of block-oriented structure that I'm already used to writing when I write uh, methods in Java and so forth. And then the, the key thing is that map takes one argument, and that's a function literal. You know, if this were Java code, I'd have to instantiate some interface as an anonymous inner class and, and implement some function. Actually, that's exactly what we're going to do. <clears throat> Only uh, we're going to let the compiler do it for us. Anyway, this is a function literal that's going to get called for each element in that list and just convert it to an uppercase item. And the structure is that anything to the left of that funky looking arrow is the argument list to this anonymous function. Uh, that's a hash rocket if you're from Ruby. Uh, that's what they call those little arrows. And then the function body is everything to the right. Now I could have had parentheses, I could have had curly braces around the uh, function uh, body, but because I've only got one statement, I didn't want them, so I can leave them off. And that's true of methods also. You can leave the curly braces off methods if you've only got one statement. The other thing that's going on here is I'm actually inferring the type of the argument, and that's the compiler can do this for me because it knows I've got strings. But if I really wanted to show it, I could do it like this. It turns out you have to use the parentheses here or it becomes ambiguous, like is the, is the string arrow to uppercase part of the type or is it just string? Yes? Um, in Haskell, you could apply that <coughs> to other types and the compiler would generate, it would be a generic basically. Right. Uh, not as well as, as Haskell. It, it, to sort of answer the question, the, the typing, the inf inferring of types is not as good in, in Scala and it's really because of inheritance and subtyping through that mechanism. It makes it a lot harder to do type inference. Um, all right, so anyway, this is what it would look like if I explicitly gave you the type of the function argument. 
Well, we've talked a lot about type inference, or maybe a little bit about it so far. So let me actually show you what's going on under the hood and give you a little bit more of a flavor for the typing and how that works. In other words, how the sausages are made. <clears throat> so here's a sort of a stripped down uh, version of the code as it appears in the actual ha uh, Scala library. You got me talking about Haskell now. Um, so it's a, a class list, uh, and it takes a, a type parameter because it could be list of int, list of string, and so forth. In Java, they would use the angle brackets instead of the square brackets, right? Why did they use square brackets in Haskell? <laughs> Scala? I've been actually learning Haskell lately. That's why I kind of got it on my brain, which I recommend, actually. It's very interesting. All right, well, the reason they use uh, square brackets, not angle brackets, is because you might want to use the angle bracket for a less than or greater than method on your type, and that would be ambiguous. So you can't use square brackets in your method names for this reason, because they have to keep it separate. But they let you use angle brackets for your own type declarations, or method definitions. So anyway, this is a list of some type A. And then when I do a map, I'm trying to convert from a type A to a type B. So notice how the map definition works. It's also parameterized by some type B. It takes a function. And so it, the way to read this argument is this is a function named F. It's a function that maps an A to a B in the mathematical terminology. Or it takes an A argument, returns a B argument. And then notice how you d declare the return value of a function, which is, it turns out that the, um, the arguments always have to be typed in methods for, due to the limitations of the type inference algorithm. But sometimes the return values can be inferred. In this case, I need to be explicit because this is, uh, actually, is this? Yeah, it turns out class is a, is a uh, sub, is a, it's a parent class. It's, it's actually abstract. I believe map is actually uh, anonymous, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, uh, let's not talk about, let's not worry about that at the moment. Or not anonymous, I mean abstract. But anyway, the return type is going to be a list of type B. And again, it's colon return value type. OK, let's drill into this a little bit more. So again, it's parameterized in type A. Uh, we declare map as a, as a method that takes another type parameter B. It takes a single argument that's a function that maps A to B and returns a list. Now, here's where we get to the part that functions are actually objects. It turns out that because we're on the JVM, we can't have bare functions, at least as of Java 6. Java 7 is going to fix that problem. Pardon me? I think we lost Lambdas. Uh, we lost Lambdas, but the, well, you're, you're right about that, actually. I was thinking of the dynamic um, method dispatch, but maybe, I'm, maybe you're right. Maybe I can't, you can't really get away without having a wrapper object. The point is, though, that at least as of today, for released versions of Java, you actually have to wrap these anonymous functions in, a, in an object. And what Scala does is it has a built-in library uh, abstract class, think of it as that for right now, called a tr uh, function one. And we'll come back to what trait means in a minute. It's called function one because it takes one argument. So it turns out there's function one, two, three, all the way up to 22. I have no idea why they stopped at 22. But you can have up to 22 arguments in your anonymous functions, which is a really good design idea. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is parameterized. Uh, a is will be an argument type, and, and R will be the return type. Um, what's the minus and plus doing? Well, it turns out this is because of covariant and contravariant typing of subtypes of functions, which we will not get into because that's really uh, shaving the yak. So we'll avoid that discussion for right now. But just imagine that it's like a function takes an int and returns a string or something. And then our apply method it doesn't have a body to it, so it's purely abstract. And that's why this trait cannot be instantiated just as it is, like any abstract class. We, we're going to have to supply that apply method somewhere. Right, I keep forgetting to go through this build. So. But you will notice, though, that the, we got that word apply showing up again. It's for exactly the same reason as we saw before. When you call this function object, the compiler will generate a call to the apply method on the object. So this is what actually happens. You write this nice little syntax at the top here, you know, uh, s arrow, s to uppercase. And the compiler generates this anonymous subclass of function one, where it fills in the, the body of apply to be whatever you said in 
uh, the literal that you wrote. So instead of writing the usual boilerplate you have to do with Java, where you instantiate an interface and implement a method, it just does it for you, effectively, and you get to write these nice little function literals. <clears throat> and then just to re uh, also recap, I, I took advantage of the liberty of, of substituting curly braces for parentheses so I get that nice uh, block-like structure that we're used to in other languages. Even Ruby kind of looks like this, right? All right, let's talk about a little bit more functional hotness that you get with Scala. And actually what I'm about to talk about, you could actually do in Java or C Sharp. There's a few limitations in those languages that wouldn't make it quite as clean, but it's still something you could do. And this is, I think, a great example of taking some functional ideas and pulling them back into your object-oriented language. <coughs> we all know that, know that nulls are a huge source of bugs, right? And we'd like somehow to get rid of nulls. Well, maybe the best way to do it is to actually have a type that represents the notion that I either have a value or I don't. And that in Scala, which actually borrows from something called the maybe monad in Haskell, uh, we have this option type, which is I'm optionally going to have a value. Uh, I'll explain some keywords that show up here that we haven't heard about before in a, in a minute. But for right now, let's just focus on a few key elements. Um, this is actually an abstract data type, if you know what those are. The, um, the interface, if you will, is the option, and then the actual two possible states that you're allowed to have, or, or whatever you, term you want to use, the data structures, say, are either a sum that represents, yes, I do have a value, and here it is, or a none, which represents I don't have a value. All right, let's see why this is useful, and then I'll come back and explain a few other syntactic things on this slide. Well. Uh, if you look at the get method in the Java map API, and here I've just kind of schematically uh, written out what it looks like, it says it returns a value of type V, but it's actually lying to you because it may return a null. And you have to know that. Just That's just part of, the, of being a Java programmer is knowing which methods might return null or being extremely paranoid and always checking for null and everything, which none of us are typically disciplined enough to do. In other words, we, the type system and, and the runtime is not enforcing this uh, notion of maybe I do or maybe I don't have a value when you call map with a particular key, map get. The Scala version, on the other hand, its map class returns an option V. So it's doing a couple of things for you. First of all, just by reading the signature of the method, you know exactly what the behavior is going to be. It's either going to return something wrapped in a sum or it's going to return a none, meaning it didn't have something for that key. And because it's statically checked, I can't just, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'll try to die quietly up here. Um, because it's statically checked, it's, there's no way I could call like normal V methods on this option object because it's not going to type check, right, unless it's two string or something. So I'm going to have to do something to check that I have a none or a sum and then extract the value out. And that could be really tedious, except there's another really nice feature in the language that lets us do that in an elegant way. Actually, there's several ways to do it, but here's one of them. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to instantiate a map with two key value pairs. And notice this interesting little syntax I'm using that might look familiar if you're a Ruby programmer. And in fact, the slides I mentioned that I skipped over, they, they explain how this uh, literal syntax for maps is implemented. But basically, it's the keys are like the strings one and two, and the values are the two integers. Along with that is this pattern matching facility that is also borrowed from functional languages. <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try one. I'll try not to spit this at the uh, microphone here. <laughs> yeah, this, these these are helpful. Okay. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm calling get on the map object with a key four, and then I'm using this keyword match that sets up a pattern match, which you can think of as like a switch statement on steroids. And then I, I can look at the different cases that I might have. Now in this case, it's exhaustive if I look for either none or some. Now if it's, uh, if it's a none, the last case, I'll just return the default value that I decided would be zero. But if it's a sum, the other power of this uh, pattern matching facility is 
it lets me extract the value that's inside that sum and assign it to the variable i, and then I can do whatever I want with it. So in this simple example, I'm just instantiating a variable named n, and it's either going to be whatever i is or zero. I should say this idiom is so common, there's actually a get or else method on map where I can just give it a default value as the second argument and not have to do this pattern match. But I, I love this, I use this all the time because um, it's, it's elegant, it's easy to understand once you get the gist of it, and uh, it, it just types safely verifies that I'm not going to try to call some bizarre method on a null object because I can avoid nulls altogether. Now it is true that we're on the JVM, we cannot actually avoid nulls altogether, especially if you call a native library, but uh, we can, at least in our own code, we can avoid the use of nulls and be very explicit about those cases where I either have something or I don't. Okay, let me return and fill in a few details uh, on that, those three uh, types that we uh, declared, option, sum, and none. Uh, you probably know what the abstract keyword is because that's, that's old school from Java and so forth. What this sealed keyword does is it says that no one is allowed to subclass this thing unless they do it in the same source file. And this is Scala's way of preventing me as an idiot from creating yet another sum that holds three items or something. Because that would break all my code that assumes there's only two different subtypes. So sealed is very important. Now, recall that when I did the pattern match, I used the case keyword to do the different, well, cases. <coughs> if I put that keyword in front of a type, it, the compiler generates a whole bunch of stuff for me just for free that makes it easy to use these things inside pattern matches. It gives me good two string and equals and hash code methods. Uh, it even does things like I don't have to put the val keyword in front of constructor arguments. It'll automatically make them uh, immutable fields. So for example, if you're building little structural objects like a person has a first name, last name, zip code, it's really nice to do them as case statements because you and in fact, I'll show you an example in a minute, because you collapse down a lot of code that you would have to write yourself. Another thing that I showed that is kind of strange, I actually declared an object. I didn't declare a class. Scala bakes in the singleton design pattern. Now, singleton gets a lot, gets a lot of criticism by people, and for good reasons. It's sometimes abused. It's kind of um, like a, a, cl a classic idiom in Java is to declare like a singleton factory object, but then it's hard to test if you want to like override it, mock it out. But there are cases where it makes perfect sense. None cannot have any state because it's not holding anything. There's only ever going to be one value that a none could have. So it really makes a lot of sense both for efficiency and also for sort of stating its, its nature to just say, give me one of these things, I'll no, never eat, need more than one. And we can do that if we declare something as an object rather than a class or trait. And the last thing that's just a technical detail, notice that the parameter that I gave the superclass is nothing. That's a special type that's actually the child of every other type in the system. It can't have any instances, but what it does is it's, it, you can say option nothing and that will always be a valid replacement for say option of string, option of int, et cetera, you know, in the way these sort of uh, covariant subtyping things are supposed to work without going into a lot of details. So if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But the, for technical reasons, we have to have something like nothing. <clears throat> and this is one of the reasons it'd be harder to do this in Java because there's no similar concept in Java. All right. But anyway, I hope you get the gist that I can define abstract data types in Scala, and I can do pattern matching to deconstruct things when I need to, and I can uh, also use the abstract data type facilities like sealed to be sure that I only have allowed subtypes of things. But in particular, this option type can be used to effectively get rid of nulls in my design and more clearly express the way the code is actually going to behave at runtime. Well, we've seen a, a few examples of succinct code so far, which I think is a really important uh, feature of the language. And I think there's actually some general evidence that fewer lines of code you have, typically the fewer bugs you have. So let's just recap a few of those. 
One of them is this idea of, of so-called infix operator notation, where I, I can call a method as if it's like an operator and not have all that extra punctuation that just kind of obscures what's going on. The type inference lets us get rid of a lot of the stuff that's annoying about Java, which is that I have to explicitly say what the type is all the time. And, and not only is it nice in an example like this where I don't have to say hash map of string in person twice, it's actually really nice sometimes when you're not exactly sure what the type actually is, but you don't necessarily need to know. You're happy to let the uh, type inference figure it out and, uh, you know, okay, fine, just, just do the thing. I don't care. Whereas in Java, you just always have to know what it is you're working with. Oh, and a couple of other things we haven't really talked about, but maybe you've kind of inferred, is um, that semicolons are inferred. They are actually present in the language if you want to use them. Uh, for a case like uh, this hash map constructor where I don't have any arguments, I can drop the parentheses. And also return statements are inferred. So it'll always just return what the last expression is out of a block. But again, you can use all those things if you want to and need to. <clears throat> all right, let's talk a little bit about this um, uh, as a last point before I get into the next thing. This idea of, of user-defined factory methods not only do I not have to use new, but I can have list return an appropriate subtype depending on the arguments. I think in the case of list, it doesn't actually do this, but map is a great example. When you give map a set of key value pairs, it will decide what's the right implementation, trading off like performance versus space utilization. Like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you have a map with just two key value pairs to use like a hash table or something. You could just stick them in an array and the, and the search is you know, fast enough, for example. So this is a really nice idea for modularity is being able to abstract over the notion of how you create things. I love this slide because this is typical Java code and it's deliberately too small to read. It's basically a person type that has first name and age, last name and age. And in typical Java style, you have to create, you know, declare the fields, declare the constructor, have its argument list, assign the arguments to the fields, you write your getters and setters. If you do much Java, you probably got used to just having IntelliJ or Eclipse generate all this boilerplate for you, but that's, you, you know, we should always stop back and say, if my tools are generating code for me, is that actually a good thing? Here's what the same thing looks like in Scala. Uh, I just declare the class person, and by using the var keyword on this argument list, I automatically get those getters and setters for free. And again, the class body, this is going to build here in a second, there it goes. The class body uh, is the constructor body. I actually don't have any need for a class body in this case because all I'm doing is getters and setters. So uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to collapse 20 lines or whatever the hell that was. It was actually more like maybe 30, down into four lines of code. Actually, the, I would, the way I would really declare this class is like this. I would use that case keyword it would infer vowels instead of vars, and that would give me an immutable object, which is much better for robustness, concurrency, all those things. <clears throat> and it would give me all the stuff I like, like two string equals hash code, pattern matching, all kinds of cool stuff. So you'll see a lot of this. For these little structural kind of classes in Scala, you'll see them declared as case classes and so forth all the time. All right, I mentioned the word traits before when I was talking about functions. Let's go back and actually see what they are. And basically what they're doing is fixing a limitation in the Java object model that really limits our ability to compose units of behavior together. <clears throat> um, the term mixin is an old term. It actually goes back to the list days in the 60s or something. But it's the idea that if I have some reusable behavior, I'd love to just mix it in wherever I need it without any fuss. Now, so what, uh, what would we do in Java? Suppose I'm creating a, a, like a server class that's going to serve up web pages or whatever. And I, I have that logger class I created at the very beginning. I'd like to uh, reuse that logger as something I just plug into my server class. But so how would I do it in Java? Well, I could pass it as an argument as a field, but that's actually a bit, a lot of effort. Or, you know, it's enough effort I might screw it up somehow. I could try to subclass logger, but that doesn't make a lot of sense from the usual object-oriented inheritance. I mean, maybe, yes, yeah, server is a logger. That's not too bad. If I had done like person is a logger, you'd think I was crazy, for example. 
but that's still not what we'd like, and especially if I want a really subclass like abstract server or something. And logger is not an interface, so I can't just implement it. That's a problem. So while Java is actually really good at promoting the idea of, um, there it goes, promoting the idea of using abstractions, it's actually really bad at giving us a mechanism to build reusable modules of behavior and then mix them in. We always end up inventing some scheme to do it ourselves, like passing fields in and making sure we pass the right fields. So traits tries to fix this problem. And you can think of them as one or two ways, whichever you prefer. <clears throat> you can think of them as like interfaces that also have optional implementations. They can be pure abstract if you want, in which case they behave exactly like Java interfaces. And in fact, they are Java interfaces at the bytecode level. Or you can add implementations like for the boilerplate methods. If you prefer, though, like if you come from a C++ background, you could think of it as like abstract classes, not actually necessarily abstract. You could have everything defined. And then there's a, a limited form of multiple inheritance that's supported. Now, I should say that it, it, it's limited in that it doesn't have the diamond of death, if you've heard of that expression in, in C++. So it does actually fix the problems that C++ had. All right, so let's revisit our logger that we uh, started with. And I'm going to refactor it into a trait that I can then use as a mix-in. Now, one thing that you cannot do as a technical detail, you can't have constructor arguments for traits. I can still declare fields like I did for this val or this level, but I, can, I either have to assign it a value, like a default, or I have to leave it abstract. <coughs> and then classes that use it will have to fill it in. But otherwise, this is identical to what we had before. So let's see how this actually works. I'm going to instantiate a server object, and on the fly, I'm going to mix in this logger trait. Now, I could actually declare a class that does this mixing if I was going to do this over. And, you, know, you create a bunch of objects. But you'll often see people do this. I just need one server. I just want to mix in my logger as I go. I don't want to declare a named class for this. So I'm just going to say new server with arguments with logger. And then notice that I have this body. It's basically an anonymous subclass body, as in Java. And, I'll, I, and you have to have this because I have to initialize the level value. I'll just set it to error. And then when I call server.log, it'll be, you know, my hair's on fire kind of thing. So this is, I think, one of the beautiful features, especially if you really want to use a lot of object oriented programming, that you really can build reusable mix-ins and compose objects of these little pieces. I think it's really powerful. And again, we, have to, we do have to define the abstract values when we try to instantiate an object with this trait. OK, we're coming near the end. The last thing I want to talk about is give you an example of sort of a functional style of doing concurrency, which is using actors. Has anyone ever played with an actor library or familiar with concepts? If you play with Erlang, it's basically baked into the language in Erlang. And, and Erlang is the best, you know, uh, what's the term I want to use? Uh, proof by example. Well, if you want to do shared mutable state, multi-threaded programming, you basically have to become an expert in the contents of this book. And even then, you're going to make mistakes. And this is a great book, actually, that every Java programmer should know. But uh, I think in a lot of ways, multi-threaded programming is really the assembly language of concurrency. And it's an abstraction layer that we often need, but not all the time. And most of the time, we can work at a higher level of abstraction and let some genius figure out how to make it work under the hood. And the actor model is one of those examples. And it's basically the idea that I have these sort of autonomous actors that uh, co coordinate their work by message passing. And also, you know, a good actor model doesn't let you have shared mutable state. Now, the, the objects might be mutable, but if only one actor at a time is working on them, then you have basically uh, thread safety for free, as it were. Now, this is not a new model. It's been around since the 70s, and it was made famous by Erlang. And in fact, um, Scala stole a lot of the idioms in Erlang. Um, so if you've done any Erlang program, some of the things will look familiar. All right, so I have a simple example, and you can download this from GitHub and try it out if you want. Um, so imagine I work for Pixar, and I'm rendering Toy Story 25 or whatever. 
and uh, I want to see each frame, you know, each new uh, frame as it gets as it comes off the render farm. So I'm going to have one actor that's like on my workstation that's listening for updates, and it it's going to fire off <coughs> messages to my render or my drawing system that will draw shapes on the screen. So I'll send it a rectangle, send it a circle, it'll draw them. If I send it anything else that it doesn't understand, we'll do some error handling. And if I send it the string exit, it means we're all done and time to clean up. Okay, I'll need a few uh, you know, classes to represent two-dimensional geometric shapes. Um, we've kind of discussed the details of how this works. I've got a point that represents x, y coordinates. And then I'll have an abstraction called shape <clears throat> that has a, a draw method that's abstract. And uh, each subclass, and we'll only talk about circles and rectangles, they'll have to implement what draw means. Um, circles point, uh, you know, the center point and radius is all I need. For rectangles, I'll assume they're not rotated, so just give me the lower left point, the height and the width, and then I can draw it. So just for simplicity, that's what's there. All right, let's get to the interesting bits. There is a, uh, an actor library built into uh, the Scala standard library, but I actually prefer the one that's in this framework called Akka. And that Akka is like a mountain and goddess in Swedish mythology or something. But it's, it's a much uh, more production-ready actor library. So just as in Java, I can declare a package. I can import the stuff I want to use. Notice I'm using underscores, wildcards, instead of star. Once again, you might want to use star as a method name but maybe not underscore. But anyway, I'm importing everything out of this package, and then I'm going to declare an actor uh, called shape drawing actor that you know, extends the actor uh, base class, typical stuff. The key thing is I need to define a receive method that will get called every time a message comes in. And that method looks like this. And it uses the pattern matching stuff that we've already seen. So. The first thing that might happen is that you might pass me a shape, and I'm going to look for the type of the message first. And if it's a shape, I know I can do something with it. And if it's a shape, I'm going to uh, assign that message to a variable s of type shape, so then I can call shape methods. Um, <clears throat> if it's the word exit, I know we're done. I'll clean up. And uh, if it's um, anything else, I'll, I'll assign it to the variable x and do some error handling. So once again, I'm binding stuff to these variables so that I can work with them with, of the appropriate type. So what happens? If I get a shape, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a, a right-hand arrow to indicate messages printed by the drawing actor and a left-hand arrow to, for messages printed by the uh, driver. So I'll just call s.draw on the shape and then send a reply back to the caller. Similar sort of print and response if, uh, if we're done. And similarly, if we get an error message. And uh, we'll see the output of this in a second. Uh, Self.reply is a way of getting the actor, let's call it essence, and then sending a reply to the caller. And uh, here it is. It's coming up. Oh, I knew what I missed. OK. This is all. This is it. That's it. That's the code for this, shit. this drawing actor. It's like 20 lines. It's actually very tiny. Let's look at the driver quickly. Um, Here's one of those objects again. This is the standard way of defining main. I declare an object called driver. I declare my main method. The main method uh, uses this actor of method to instantiate a driver actor. Now notice I have an object in class both with the same name. They're called companions, and that's perfectly legal Scala. And it's the driver that's the class that I'm instantiating as an actor. I'll start it. And then I use the Erlang bang operator to send the message. So that's like stole right from Erlang. But again, it's a method call. And I'm, now I'm going to send the go message to my driver. And here's my driver. Uh, it's pretty much what we've seen already. It's an actor. It creates the drawing actor instance. It starts it, and then it defines its receive method. And in the receive method, um, this is the message sent by main. It's you know go. It's going to fire off four asynchronous messages to the drawing actor. Draw a circle, draw a rectangle, do something with pi. That'll be the error case, and exit. It'll also get a goodbye message back from the drawing actor, so it'll it'll handle cleanup. Notice that it um, 
we'll, we'll stop both actors when this happens, and that'll, that's how things will clean up nicely. Otherwise, it'll just, uh, sorry, otherwise it'll just print out one of these left arrow messages with whatever it gets back. All right, let's see all this, let's see, yeah, let's see it all together. So, the top of the slide is what was in that Go handler, just to remind you of the order in which things were sent. And then at the bottom here is what you would actually see coming out. So it turns out the four messages printed by the uh, drawing actor will always be in that order. In other words, it preserves message reception order. A unless you're cr calling across the network, in which case you might get out of order messages. The four left-hand arrows are what will always be printed in, that, in the right order because uh, again, the call and response will actually be done in the right order. However, when you run this, you'll probably get interleaving of those four. In other words, uh, it won't even finish sending those top four messages before it starts getting replies, at least when I ran it. But anyway, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to creating these two little simple actors that can talk to each other. Um, there's a little bit of wrapper code, obviously, in a real implementation, but not much more. I want to finish then with um, Emphasizing one point back in the shape drawing actor, this is, I think, a great example of combining functional style pattern matching with object-oriented dispatch, you know, polymorphic behavior. You might have been told that switch statements are evil uh, if you've learned object-oriented programming, but in fact, this is a great example of, of where they're used properly to do very different behaviors, but benefit, uh, gain the benefit of object-oriented programming as well. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, Scala is, uh, come on. I hope you'll, you believe that it's a better uh, job in C++, or C Sharp, certainly C++ in my opinion. It is object-oriented and functional, and we tried to highlight a little bit of the synergy there. And I personally find it very succinct, elegant, and powerful, and I hope you do too. So any questions before we break? Yes. Yes, I think there are people using it for Android. I don't really know the details myself, but there's some guys in New York that I know that are doing it. Did you have a question? Uh, well, I was going to ask you, you seem to focus a lot on polyglot programming as well. What, what have you found some of the challenges between interacting with like, Clojure and Scala and Ruby in, in like, the same application? I've only used uh, Scala with Java code, and there it's pretty seamless. It's a bit tricky going from Java to Scala, right, but right. it's easy going the other way. I haven't really tried to interoperate with Clojure. Um, just uh, the more general question would be, where is Scala useful? And it's useful anywhere Java is useful. So it's really not a browser language. You know, use JavaScript, et cetera. Yeah. How about um, just broad performance ca characteristics? Is it like <coughs> equivalent code, same as JVM? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, it obviously depends, but for the most part, it generates code as optimal as, as the Java compiler. There are some constructs, like if you create, you tend to create more objects in Scala, so you'll have more garbage collection, okay. unless you're careful about that part of it. That's probably the main area where the performance will be different. Uh, yeah. You compile, after you compile, what do you get out of it? Is it a class file? You actually do get class files, and uh, I didn't say this. You don't have to follow the directory convention for source files, but the class files are written in the right directories matching package structure. And then they just look like Java jar files, or class files. We should probably break for the next group, but I'd be happy to talk with anybody afterwards. So thanks again. Um, next talk will be Matt O'Keefe with uh, Cloudy in Open Source.